So the passage this week is a difficult one. Uh, some consider it the most difficult in the New Testament to interpret. There are many interpretive issues and there are many diverse answers to those issues. Uh, so instead of explaining all of the views uh, that people give and why they're wrong, uh, we're going to focus this morning on the conclusions that I've come to through my study and what it means for us. Uh, and after the sermon, we'll have a time of questions and answers if you have any questions. So last week, we started the final and longest section of Peter's teaching on the application of salvation, uh, which was the righteousness in suffering. Started in chapter 3, verses 13, and it goes until chapter 5, verse 11. And Peter's instructions in verses 13 through 17 were that if we zealously pursue what's good, we'll have peace. That's the general principle and the general um, law or, or reality which they face and they live in. But, he says, if we should suffer for doing righteousness, we need to keep a few things in mind. Uh, he uses a rare optative form of the verb. It says, uh, this is a possibility. It's not present, but it's a possibility. And you need to be prepared for that possibility. And now, it's amazing that he's saying that this is just a possibility, and yet he spends how much time? More time to that one subject in, in the book than any other subject. So it is very important for us to give a testimony and be a witness uh, because it's when we are bumped, it's when we're in trials or suffering when we see what's really inside and we see where we really put our faith. Uh, so the few things that he says that we need to keep in mind when we're suffering for doing what's right, uh, so suffering unjustly, is number one, we are blessed with stronger faith. Uh, faith that says, I'm still going to do what's right even if I do suffer. Number two, we need to realize and remember and keep in mind that Christ is Lord above all other authority. So even if there's uh, governmental, uh, in your workplace, uh, husbands, uh, any kind of authority that says to you do something different and is threatening you, uh, what we need to fear is God. He is the Lord over all. Uh, and that's an irreverential fear of not wanting to ever displease him. Uh, for, third thing is that when we suffer for righteousness, the way we respond gives us an opportunity to witness, to share Christ's uh, attitude, Christ's character, Christ's glory to those who are watching. And we're supposed to be ready to give a defense for those who ask us to give an account for the hope that's in us. You know, what, what are you believing in? trusting in that makes you not afraid of the authority that's here or, or afraid of getting in trouble or afraid of, of getting hurt. Uh, and that's what we need to be ready with a defense, uh, with an answer. And then finally, if we are suffering for doing what's right in, or doing what's good, we need to remember that it's God's will. If it's God's will, he has a purpose. He has a plan. We might not be able to see it, but God has a plan. So, these four truths are difficult to accept, especially when we're in the midst of the world that's crashing in all around us. They're hard to uh, really internalize and to visualize how does this all play out. You know, do, do we really feel blessed? Do we really think we're blessed when we're, we're suffering persecution? Is Christ really in control? Uh, how can I share life with these people who are hurting me who are literally taking life from me. How can I share life with them? How can I uh, be a testimony? Does God really have a purpose for my suffering? I can't see it. Is it really there? To answer these, to answer these questions uh, and these difficulties and the doubts that we sometimes have when we suffer, especially when we're doing what's right, because oftentimes when we suffer for doing what's right, what's the first response we have? What did I do wrong? Where did I sin? Why do, I don't deserve this, so I must have done something. He's saying, no, there's, a, there's another option. Uh, and what Peter goes to now is the example of Christ. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. So this morning, we will look at four points that Peter will make concerning the example of Christ's suffering for doing good. Like always, let's go ahead and read the whole passage before we get into the trees. So let me start with verse 18. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he may bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, 
who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of, of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. Now, you may notice in your Bible, verses 18 and 19 may be indented and may look something like this. Uh, most scholars view this portion as probably originating from an ancient hymn or an ancient creed. Uh, based on their parallel structure, the vocabulary, and the sounds that the words make in Greek. Uh, but there's also a great debate as far as did Peter influence it? Did he change things? Where does it end? Where does it begin? Uh, so there's really no consensus as far as where or how this is a hymn. Uh, but that really makes little difference as far as the meaning because the final form in which we find it in Peter is inspired. Uh, and because it is short and pithy in Greek and has parallel structures and a lot of the same meter and, and rhyming sounds or sounds that go together, it indicates that this portion was meant to be memorized. And thus, it has important theology, New Testament theology. And in fact, I'm going to suggest to you that this is part of the defense. He's giving them the answer. Here's the defense that you should be giving. This is something you should know. And this is, so that this is something I'm giving you in a condensed form that you can easily memorize so you can share it. So now let's go ahead and look at the text itself in more detail. The first point uh, is, uh, of Christ's suffering is that Christ's suffering had a purpose. Verse 18. The first part of verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. Now, the word suffering there in Greek is a, there's a textual variant in the Greek manuscripts. Some of your Bibles might say died, for Christ also died. Uh, in fact, the New American Standard says died. Uh, but the original text, it, it's, it's suffered. Um, he experienced harm from others that ended in death. The context of Peter, what we've been talking about, focuses in on suffering. And typically when we talk about uh, Christ's atonement, his work on the cross, we usually say death. So it's far more likely that a scribe changed it to something that's far more um, normal than leaving it with suffering. Suffering focuses on um, physical harm that may or may not end in death. But in this case, we know Christ suffered uh, and ultimately died for sin. So, uh, Christ also suffered for sin. The word for sin, that, that phrase, for sin, it, it connotes that he suffered on behalf of sin. The phrase is used in the Old Testament of sacrifices that were offered for sins, uh, especially, specifically the sins of people. And he did this once for all. Now, in English, it, it sounds like it may be, you know, it's three words there. But in Greek, it's actually only one word. It's hapax. It's at one time. It doesn't mean once for all people, but it's at one time complete and perfect sacrifice. It happened at one time. And then he describes it in parallel form, the just suffered, implied verb, for the unjust. The just means the righteous. Jesus, who was righteous. He was the righteous one who did not deserve de death, but he suffered for, in place of, the unjust ones, plural, who did deserve death. And those unjust ones, that includes you and I, if we put our faith in him. So the descriptions here are parallel to what Peter has just said uh, in verse 14. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, uh, and then in 17, for it is better for God, I'm sorry, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for, for doing what is wrong. Though what is right here is not the same word as righteousness. It's actually for doing what is good 
but it's a synonymous and parallel term. Uh, in verse 13, the parallel phrase to this one has good in parallel form with righteous. So, what he's saying here, what Peter's describing is that the suffering of God's messianic king on a cross uh, was for sins. He didn't deserve it, but we did. So was this God's will? That, that Christ should suffer? Did this have a purpose? He goes on to say, Christ also suffered for sins that, uh, once for all, the just for the unjust, so that, here's the purpose, so that he might bring you to God. The bring there uh, has the idea of presenting us in God's presence as an offering. He's presenting us for dedication, for his use as a living sacrifice that's reconciled to God. Uh, some of your translations might say to bring us to God. Uh, originally, the wording is actually you. Uh, and it shows a direct link from Christ's suffering in God's will and the personal benefit of those who are reading this letter who are actually believers. So, which again, it includes us. Peter was writing to them, but it does include us. Uh, so, he suffered uh, the just for the unjust so that God, that he might bring you to God. So these words form the most succinct and important words concerning the doctrine of atonement. Now, atonement just simply means to make one. To, it's a process of bringing unity. So that, uh, it's just where God dealt with the problem, which was sin, sin problem, and brought us back. That's what the idea of atonement. So looking at it this way, it's Christ also suffered for sins once for all. That shows that Christ was the perfect offering for sin. Because unlike the animal sacrifices that had to be done repeatedly, Christ suffered only once. It was good enough for all time. He was therefore a perfect sacrifice for sin. He was the just, suffered for the unjust. He was perfect in that he was completely righteous, pure sacrifice. And he suffered for our place. That's the concept of propitiation and vicarious now let me explain that. Propitiation is the idea that he received the wrath of God. He received the full wrath of God for us. And that whole idea of for us is vicarious, meaning he was our substitute. We are guilty. Here's our fine. Christ paid that fine for us. So therefore, there's no fine for us. He didn't deserve that fine, but he took it out of love. He was our substitute receiving the wrath of God in our place. And then number three, so that he might bring you to God. That indicates personal reconciliation. There was the goal. He removed that which caused the division between God and us in order to bring a restored relationship. And that, these three points, that's the defense that we give back to any of those who ask for our hope. Uh, is that we have a king, God sent a king to suffer for our sins once for all. Uh, and he was righteous and perfect. And he suffered in my place, showing me and demonstrating me love. The love of God. Uh, in, in order that he may bring me to God, restore me to God. So believers don't suffer vicariously for others when we suffer. But uh, our suffering, likewise, has a purpose. God has a purpose for us. And he can bring about great things uh, through us suffering, although demonstrating his right righteousness and his glory through that suffering. So Peter returns, uh, then returns to, to describe more about his suffering and how it parallels the believers, where it says, So Christ suffered for sins, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now, in Greek, the word for but is a little bit more, um, uh, gives us more information in Greek. It literally has the idea of, on the one hand, he's put the death in the flesh, but on the other hand, 
He was made alive in the spirit. There's, a, there's really an emphasis on the contrast between these two realities. So the first one is being put to death in the flesh. So from an earthly perspective, something that's visible to, visible to the world, something that we can see, Christ was rejected by the authorities and he was executed. And that suffering ended with death. He was put to death in the flesh. By all, all counts, it's, it could seem like he was being punished. But he was made alive in the spirit. From a spiritual perspective, the invisible reality of the spiritual world, Christ was made alive with the Father. The word for made alive implies that he was spiritually dead. Because he was made alive. So when he became sin, during the three hours of darkness, after which the temple veil was torn in two, after which he said, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? After he said, it is finished. Just before that, that's when he became sin. That's when he took on the sin of the world and received the wrath of God. He became spiritually dead. And then, after the three hours of darkness were done, he said, it's finished. My God, why did you forsake me? Into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he did that, when he died, he was very much alive. Spiritually, he was very much alive. So, uh, even though he became sin and received his punishment while on the cross, uh, that ended. And that was completed. It was done. The sacrifice was made. And Jesus committed his spirit into the Father's hands. And the repentant thief was with Christ in paradise that day. So with earthly eyes, it looked like God could have been judging him. And Christ could have received the judgment of God, which he did spiritually. But when he physically died, he was very much alive. So the first point of Christ's example of suffering is that Christ remained righteous in his suffering and it had a great purpose. Hugely, vastly important purpose from which all believers personally benefit. He paid for our sins in order to bring us to God, to give us eternal life. The second point of Christ's example is that Christ gave a defense in the midst of great suffering. Verse 19 through 20, part A. So I'm going to read that whole thing. It says, In which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. Now the phrase in which here, it, re it is a temporal phrase uh, in Greek that's peculiar to Peter. Uh, so during which time? Well, what time is that? Well, that's the time that he was suffering for sin. When he was suffering, uh, when he died spiritually, he also went and made proclamation. Uh, his soul, his immaterial part, when he received sin, he was separated from God. He went to hell, which is separation from God. He suffered separation from the Father, and yet he still made proclamation. Now, this is not a preaching of the gospel. Uh, that word is uangelizo, and that's used in chapter 4, verse 6. It's not the word here. Uh, the word here just simply means to announce. It can mean to preach, but it, in this case, it just means to announce. Uh, and he announced these things to the spirits who had died in the generation of the flood and were held prison in hell, awaiting the judgment of God. Now, we need to remember that in, the, in ancient context, in the first century context, a jail was not used as punishment. Uh, it was not pleasant, but it was a holding place in order for you to uh, be there until you had your sentencing before a judge. Uh, that's the same thing here. Uh, those souls who are disobedient are placed in a prison, awaiting the final judgment before the throne of God. Uh, and these souls, or these spirits, were once disobedient, meaning they're not anymore. Uh, during their life they were, but not, now they're in their prison, they are completely obedient. Uh, when they were alive on earth, they disobeyed God. And thus, do you see a distinction and a contrast again between flesh? When they were in their flesh, they were disobedient. Unlike Christ, who was obedient, uh, 
they were disobedient in their flesh, and now, since they have died, now they're in prison. Whereas uh, Christ is going to have quite a different outcome. So, we need to ask two questions based on what this text says. The first question is, uh, why does Christ speak to these spirits specifically? And the second question is, what did he proclaim? They're great questions, uh, and they need answers. So the first question is, why these spirits? Why these particular group that were disobedient during the days of Noah? Well, it's widely held that this particular generation of people were the worst generation of humanity ever. The, the worst, the wicked, most wicked people that ever lived. Because it's the only generation that God intervened and completely destroyed. And thus being the worst, these would have received the greatest punishment in hell. And you can read in Genesis 6 how uh, the author, Moses, God inspiring him, said that, described these people as being, being and doing nothing and thinking nothing than sin and wickedness. That's all they were. They were completely wicked. So if they're receiving the, uh, a greater punishment in hell, when it says that Christ went and proclaimed to them, what is it saying about Christ? If Christ proclaimed to these, he is in the worst depths of hell. He is in the lowest, uh, if we can say that. It's a spiritual realm. It's hard to, to show d dimensions. Uh, but he is in the worst part of hell. Uh, it's a way of communicating that because he's spe specifically speaking to these people who are considered the worst that ever lived. Okay, that's why these particular people. Now, what did he proclaim? He spoke of the reason why he was there. That the Father in him was atoning for sin of those who had or would put their faith in God's promises. Something that they didn't do. Uh, these spirits stand in peril to what Peter has just said earlier where he says, always be ready, telling the believers, to make a defense of everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. That do it with gentleness and reverence uh, and, and keep a good conscience before God and, and your motives and your attitudes so that in the thing in which you were slandered, uh, these who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Now, now notice it, it's will be put to shame. That's before God, before his throne. So even though you're sharing with them, it doesn't mean they're going to be saved. When we share, when we are a witness for God, when we share his truth, there are two realities. There are two effects. Number one, people get saved. God draws them and uses it, his truth, to bring people to himself. And that brings God glory. And the second result is that he condemns those people because they, having the gospel, rejected him. And either way, he gets glory. When we share the truth, we're not responsible for the results. That's God and the people to whom we're sharing. So here as well, while suffering in hell, Christ affirms the condemnation of those who have rejected God's grace. And thus, there's a contrast here when it says Christ will put them to shame. It's a will. It's a future aspect. Uh, th uh, those who, in Peter's day, who are rejecting, who are harassing, who are persecuting the believers, if they don't re repent, they will be put to shame. It looks at a future judgment. So same thing there, like the days of Noah. Uh, those people who were disobedient, all during Noah's time, and then they receive the judgment. Same thing, the lost in Peter's day do not receive immediate destruction, but God is patiently waiting. Okay, in the story here in Noah's day, what's God waiting for? He's waiting for the construction of the ark. And the construction of the ark is the instrument of deliverance that God kept his people safe inside. Those who repented, those who believed, uh, they were safe from the destruction of God's wrath that was poured out in a worldwide flood. This is Peter's next point where he contrasts the deliverance in the ark uh, 
which prefigures the deliverance in Christ. The second point was that Christ was faithful and he proclaimed God's message even in the greatest suffering. Implication, so can you. So can you. And you don't worry about the results. That's God's business. So in verse, the second verse, half of verse 20 and verse 21, we see the deliverance in the ark and it prefigures the deliverance from Christ. Uh, the second half of verse 20 says, in which, talking about the ark, in which, uh, that is, eight persons were brought safely, safely through the water. Now, it, it's interesting that it says in which a few. Uh, did you ever think about the number of people that were alive on the earth at the time of Noah's flood and yet God saves a few? Uh, it would encourage the Christian readers who have given much, who have possibly been persecuted, uh, because they also were in the minority. Uh, God's people have never been in the majority in, in the world. Uh, those who are really saved have never been the majority, and, and they won't ever be. They will always be the minority. But God brought those eight souls safely through water. He delivered them completely from danger. He saved them through. And thus, on the other side, they, they received and experienced a new life in a new world, in a restored world, restore, restored earth. Um, so, uh, this, notice the general nature of the description. Noah or his sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their wives, they're not mentioned. Notice it's even in the days of Noah. Noah's not even the subject. He's not even a character. He's not even involved in it. Why? Because all this is supposed to point you to Christ. He's giving general categories to keep the focus on Christ. Uh, and that is important because what he's about to say is, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. The corresponding to that connects, makes a connection between God's deliverance of eight people in an ark through water and New Testament baptism. Now, the text literally says, baptism, which is an antitype, now saves you. That's what it literally says in, in the first part of 21. So, baptism, which is an antitype, a fulfillment of the type, uh, meaning uh, it corresponds to that uh, Noah's Ark, now saves you from the wrath of God. The wrath that is, com is, is coming. So baptism, it, it literally means to immerse or to dunk. And Peter shows the correspondence by repeating the root of sozo, uh, of delivering. The first one is delivering through, and the second one is delivering. He shows a parallel there, repeats these words. Because God used an ark to deliver people through his judgment of water. He also uses baptism to deliver people through the judgment of his wrath. How? How does he do that? Peter first clarifies what kind of baptism he's talking about. It's not the removal of dirt from the flesh. So it's not water baptism. The Christian right of being dunked or immersed into water, uh, which was an, an act common and normal in, in society, of bathing. It was used to cleanse the body from dirt. And thus it made a great symbolic picture of an unseen spiritual reality of being cleansed from sin. And that's how it's used. But what he's saying and what he's emphasizing, specifically because he just talked about a little water, a literal water in Noah's day, is that it's not the physical act of water baptism that saves you. But what it is, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the baptism he's talking about. And that is spirit baptism. The baptism that saves you is not the outward physical ceremony of baptism, but the inward spiritual reality that baptism represents. And the way he describes it is, is an appeal to God. An appeal to God is a, is a request to God for a good conscience. Uh, which Peter has just spoken about earlier 
uh, always being ready to make a defense and keeping a good conscience so that in the time at which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ uh, will be put to shame. So having a good conscience, the opposite of which is being put to shame. So when we are appealing, we're asking for God for a good conscience, what are we doing? Well, a conscience is our divinely given internal sense of right and wrong where we hold ourselves to our highest standard, uh, or our highest perceived standard. And when we view ourselves in relation to God's holiness, we see that we fall immensely short. And thus our conscience is guilty. Right? And we deal with it different ways. We either deny it, or we try to do as much good works thinking we can build it up and do enough. But the reality is that you can't. You can't. Because you have sinned, you've done wrong, you can't have a good conscience before God. Not on your own works. Not on your own effort. So appealing or asking God for a good conscience before Him includes repentance from that wrong, confession that, that it is wrong, and asking to be forgiven from all the wrongs that we know that we've committed. We are appealing to partake in the sacrifice of Christ in his suffering. That which he suffered to bring us that life. To be immersed, as it were, in him, in his death, where his sacrifice paid for our sin. And that is, notice it says, through the resurrection of Jesus. Because it's, it's not just his death. His death paid for our sins. But his life gives us righteousness. And you, it unites us with God. So in his life, we're joined in his, his death and his, uh, where he paid for our sins, but we're also joined with his resurrection where we live in his life. We are viewed as being righteous because we are in Christ Jesus, in his righteousness. Notice the contrast between, again, flesh and good conscience, which is internal, which is, a, is your immaterial part, your spiritual person. Now, side note, uh, Peter's understanding of water baptism is a removal of dirt from the body, right? Uh, that clearly indicates that baptism was meant to be dunked, immersed. There was no way that a sprinkling can remove dirt from the body. Uh, so this is uh, one of the verses that is evidence that baptism should be uh, dunked. And then number two, uh, spirit baptism, and thus water baptism, is reserved for anyone who is old enough personally to make an appeal to God for a good conscience. And thus understanding their need and understanding Christ's sacrifice and his resurrection. And making an appeal to God to receive that salvation, to receive that life. Uh, and if there's anyone here that is at that place, that has made that appeal, uh, that wants to follow through with a physical baptism which we're commanded to do as a representative, uh, representation, a physical representation of a spiritual reality, uh, please let me know and we'll do that. Um, and that is a physical reminder, and a physical act, uh, not only as a testimony to others, but also for yourself to remember uh, and to see the importance of what you're doing when you enter into salvation. And putting your faith in Christ is that you die to sin and you live for him. Thus we are crucified with Christ, therefore we no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in us. And the life that we live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved and gave himself for us. So this is the third point. And Peter is showing how God had an incredibly important purpose in Christ's suffering, uh, which is the work of atonement. The fourth and final point is that Christ is exalted for righteous obedience. Verse 22 uh, he builds off of uh, through, uh, through, the, uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who is at the right hand of God having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. And when he talks about the right hand of God, that's a place of honor. It's where one rules with the authority and power of that throne, 
So thus Christ is ruling and has the power of God. What does that show? Well, it shows that Jesus is Lord of all. Uh, so having gone into e heaven, uh, there's a purposeful contrast in the movement. Where 19 it says, in which, during which time, in which time uh, of his spiritual suffering, he went and made proclamation the spirits now in prison. Uh, we typically think of, of the place of punishment of hell as being downward. And we typically think of heaven as being upward. So you can see how Christ went to the utter lowest parts uh, imaginable. Uh, the worst place, although he was completely obedient. And because of that obedience, God raised him and exalted him to the highest place possibly imaginable. You can see this uh, parallel in Philippians 2 where it talks about he humbled himself, took, took on the form of a servant, uh, and, and obeyed, he was obedient to God, even to the point of death, even a shameful death on the cross. And because of his obedience and his humility, God raised him up and gave him a name that's above all other names, so that every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's the same point that's being made here in the contrast in motions. Uh, so notice it says that uh, this happened... He, he raised him up, having gone up into heaven after angels, authorities, and powers had been placed in, under subjection to him. So he's in authority over them. Uh, and it lists three categories, right? Uh, angels, authorities, and powers. It's very difficult to know what he means by these three things. It's possible that the three different orders of angels, uh, the First is, could be angels as in messengers. The second, authorities. The word typically means ruling. Uh, so it could be ruling angels. And the third one, powers, usually means, talks about the ability or strength. So that could be the, those who are under the ruling angels who actually do the work. But it's very difficult to know why he's listing three things and what it, exactly it means. Uh, in the eight lists in the New Testament of groups of angels, uh, this Group of three is unique. Every other list is, has a little bit different. Uh, and there's actually uh, three other categories that are mixed into the mix, which are rulers, thrones, and dominions, all referring to spiritual uh, beings or angels. Uh, so it's hard to know exactly what he means, but the general point is crystal clear uh, that he's Lord over all, over anything. Uh, a lot of people think, uh, which is probably correct, when it says uh, authorities and powers, that refers to uh, the angelic rulers who rule over the nations. So, by saying that, Peter's confirming that God put Christ in a position where he is, in fact, Lord of all, ruler of all, above all. Uh, and that goes back to what he's already told us, is not to fear them, but fear, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. He is the one that's in control of all, all things uh, and confirms that we should fear him. And in him, we have a greater authority over sin and demon demonic powers. Um, spiritually, you are not only made alive with Christ, you are also resurrected with Christ and seated with Christ in the heavenly places, according to Ephesians 2, 5 through 6. So also, we suffer in the flesh on earth. But one day, we will be resurrected and glorified in the flesh as Christ is. And that is a great hope. Uh, and so this is a, a great um, reminder of the future of Christ and that he promised us that we would be partaking of that that we will be resurrected and be in the presence of God with him and reign with him. So I want to show you how in verses 13 through 17, uh, we, we saw that if we should suffer for doing righteousness, we need to keep four things in mind, right? First, that we are blessed with, with stronger faith. We saw that in the first part, where Christ was just and he remained just. He was a perfect sacrifice and remained sinless. The Christ is Lord over all.
We saw that in Christ being exalted for his righteous obedience. That we have an opportunity to witness when we suffer for righteousness' sake uh, and being ready to give a defense. We saw that here, where Christ gave a defense in the midst of great suffering. And then also that God has a purpose. If it's God's will for you to suffer, then you, should, you can be assured that he has a reason. And we saw, obviously, in verse 18 that he had a purpose. And also, it was prefigured in the ark, uh, which is salvation, which is reconciliation. And that's the example of Christ. So let's go over the applications. Number one, God's Messianic king lived a perfect, sinless, just life in order to offer that life as an acceptable sacrifice. He received the punishment of our sin so that he could reconcile us to God. Salvation is God's gracious gift brought about by him alone. We can rest in the knowledge that Christ has paid for our every sin and now nothing can separate us from him. Number two, verse 18 forms an easy-to-remember, succinct summary of atonement, which Peter is impl uh, uh, implicitly giving his readership as a defense or answer for those uh, who ask about the hope that's in us. This is a great verse to memorize, uh, not only the words, but also the meaning. Number three, God is patiently waiting for the full number of believers to come to be placed in Christ before he judges the world. Uh, until such time, Christ is our example to follow in proclaiming God's truth in a holy manner to those around us. Number four, we are not saved through water baptism. Rather, it is, water baptism is, a visible representation of a spiritual reality, of being united with Christ uh, in his death and resurrection which saves us from God's wrath. We were united with Christ when we appealed to God for a good conscience before him, asking to be forgiven of our sins through the sacrifice of Jesus and to live in his resurrected life. Uh, number five, the description Peter gives to water baptism is the removal of dirt from the body. And this understanding necessitates the means of baptism as, as immersion and not sprinkling. And then number six, Christ has been resurrected and exalted to the throne of God where he reigns over all rule and all authority. In him, we have authority over spiritual powers. And one day we will also be resurrected, glorified, and reign with Christ.